We invited him for one day to spend with, uh, with our group. This was about four months before his 100th birthday. This is Steph, the other person who leads our training now. So this is in Gruyere. And this is his, he's now, Hans Ruedi is now giving us, uh, uh, Hans Ruedi giving us the, the tour of his uh, museum. So you can see the size of these images. You will see it later uh, in more detail. I'm holding uh, LSD, My Problem Child, which is his, his book that he asked me to write a, a forward to. And this was a panel where, um, again, Hans really represented the, the darkest side, and Albert, at this almost 100 years old, he was still into chemistry, and his, uh, his main interest was to study the, how, the, how the flowers create all the pigments for these beautiful flowers, and what the, how, the, how the butterflies you know, create chemically the, uh, the colors of their wings. And he said, he sees the hand of creation there. Anybody who thinks that the atoms can do it by themselves, they simply don't know what they are talking about. This, uh, on the right side is Carmen, his uh, Aunt uh, wife, and this is in front of his mu museum in, in Gruyere, and this was saying goodbye. And then, um, then I went back to, to Basel to celebrate his 100th birthday. So this is when he was 100 years old. And this was official, this was in the museum of this was in the Museum of Natural History. All the psychedelic relics were there, you know, the letter from the Bundes president and so on. And great celebration. And then he invited several of us to Berg, to this village, where there was an evening celebration of his 100th birthday, just with his neighbors. The LSD was not mentioned once. I don't think they knew what he was in the world and what he discovered. <laughs> there were children, you know, chanting, uh, songs and bringing flowers and it was just you know they were celebrating a wonderful person neighbor who just was 100 years old this is carmen and uh, albert and myself okay so um, i'll take it uh, faster now so i was a psychiatrist and then suddenly i had this you know passionate interest in these in these holotropic states. So um, about, about half of the time uh, of my professional career was spent uh, doing clinical research of psychedelics, first in Prague, a psychiatric research center, then in uh, Maryland, where I was for a few years heading the last surviving American uh, research project of psychedelics. Uh, Christine and I, uh, when we went to Esalen, developed the holotropic holotropic breath work and then over the years we also worked uh, quite a bit uh, with people many people uh, who were in spiritual emergency we realized that uh, we can work with those people the way we work with people in psychedelic sessions but also in the breath work the, what happens in the breath work is really the same from the same cartography as the spiritual emergency, only the breathwork lasts two or three hours, whereas you know the the spiritual emergency can can go on for weeks. People can be in and out of, of these states. And then I had all kinds of related interests that you see, you know, meeting shamans and anthropologists, meeting anthropologists who published books. Uh, on their work with shamans that they didn't dare to present their colleagues because it would ruin their uh, reputation. Uh, I participated in quite a few native rituals with peyote, with mushrooms, with kava kava, ayahuasca and so on. Working with psychics and parapsychologists, uh, uh, near-death experience survivors and thanatologists. We had a large study working with terminal cancer patients where we were studying if mystical experiences induced by psychedelics would take away fear of death. And it turned out that it also could help 
frequently people with severe pain, even pain that was not uh, was not uh, controlled by um, narcotics. There are now, if you don't know that, there are now five universities, major universities, that are now re re repeating this research with cancer patients. It's like Harvard, UCLA, um, Johns Hopkins, uh, New York, uh, New York State University, and uh, San Francisco, UC, UC, UCSF, they're using psilocybin. So it's now returning. There is a study with MDMA and, uh, and uh, post-traumatic syndrome, the, the soldiers coming back from, from uh, Iraq, and then uh, we worked with some UFO uh, researchers and also like John Mack, some of you might know, and uh, have seen people who had either spontaneous uh, uh, the abduction, alien abduction experiences, or you see it also in the breath work, or you see it in psychedelic sessions. And then the contact with the spiritual teachers, I've already mentioned, mentioned that. If you see the common denominator is always there are holotropic states there. I mean, it became really my, my passion, you know, to study with these states. And uh, I came to the conclusion that if you study seriously what happens in these, in these sessions, and if you study the things around it, like phenomenal synchronicities, unbelievable, sort of beyond any uh, reasonable uh, statistical probability, that um, we would really radically change change uh, psychology and psychiatry. That we have, you know, paradigm challenges. I, I admire physicists how little they needed after the Michelson Morley experiment to go from Newton to Einstein and then to quantum physics. That even you know Einstein really didn't accept until until the um, end of his life how little they, they needed for a radical change, a redefinition of where we, what we are living with, which is matter. And we have this enormous amount of data, and the ac academic community does not respond to it. So I was doing all these different things and writing books, you know, on what I believe there are these challenges to the conceptual framework. And I was approaching my 70th birthday, and uh, my plans were to at, at least semi-retire and do a lot of reading and, and writing and so on. And then it, it didn't happen. But anyway, by that time the training, the holotropic breathwork training, was happening all over the world. And um, we needed the manual, you know, so that people teach pretty much the same, same things. But we didn't have it. We had all these books and it was scattered. And synchronistically, again, I got a call from uh, my publisher of State University of New York Press. And she said, you know, you've written these books for us and each of them has like one aspect of what you have seen. Would you write one book that would kind of bring it together and that would be like an introduction for people to this work? And then she said, and uh, by the way, could you just specifically focus on the observations, the, what we call now anomalous experiences that current psychiatry psychology cannot explain. And could you somehow also suggest what psychiatry psychology would have to look like to accommodate these experiences? So there was an offer to create a manual for our training. So, you know, so I got very excited, I wrote it and decided to give it a very provocative title, Psychology of the Future. You know, if you, if you write a book like um, Holotropic Mind, people can, you know, let it go. If it's Psychology of the Future, they either get excited or very, very irritated and provoked, but it's, it's more likely sort of gets, gets attention. Now, one more thing. Michael Harn, a very close friend, he lives in Mill Valley, and uh, we were part of the same meditation group and, you know, doing a lot of things together. Michael uh, is an amazing uh, um, anthropologist from the group of anthropologists who call themselves visionary anthropologists, which means when the natives are doing some ritual, they don't sit on the, 
on the tree with a little notebook and you know what the savages are doing, uh, doing proxemics and kinesics and uh, uh, visionary anthropologist when when the the natives dance the whole night they go and dance with them and if they take something they take take it with them and then the next day they become western trained um, uh, anthropologists and it's a very different anthropology so michael spent some time with the hivaro indians in in the amazon and this is this is a head hunting tribe he had the guts to go with two shamans to a sacred waterfall and take a mixture of datura and ayahuasca. And it took him several months to get it together, but he became a real shaman and started the, the Foundation for Shamanic Studies. He wrote a book called The Way of the Shaman, where he talks about the shamanic state of consciousness. And then he looks from this dual perspective of a Western-trained ac academician and uh, also somebody who underwent uh, shamanic initiation at Western Psychology and Psychiatry and says they are biased in, in two different ways. They are ethnocentric, which means this is an understanding uh, of the psyche developed by this, uh, you know, this uh, elite of the materialistic science, the behaviorists, uh, psychoanalyst and so on. And this group considers its perspective on the psyche to be superior to any other human groups ever. I mean, in history or of any country. And this is the, the sort of definitive scientific statement about what the psyche is. So that he calls ethnocentric. We have an ethnocentric bias. But the second bias is cognizantric, or we can say pragmacentric, which means that the, these theories were created on the basis of observations done in the ordinary state of consciousness. And we systematically sort of pathologized these others, with the exception of dreams. If the dreams don't repeat, and if then there's not too much anxiety, because even, then even dreams are pathological, but you can, you can you know, have just ordinary dreams and not to get diagnosis for it. Okay. Okay, so uh, the question is, what would be now psycho psychiatry, psychology that would not be ethnocentric, would be treating with respect spiritual, ritual life of, of uh, other cultures, ancient, pre-industrial cultures, and that would not be uh, cognizantric, pragmacentric, which means would incorporate now experiences and observations from non-ordinary states of consciousness. So this, how am I doing with time? Ten minutes I have, okay. So these are the, these are the points, that, this was a request, okay? Now, where do we have to ch really change our um, thinking, or, or if you want to put it stronger, where is current psychiatry and psychology wrong? Okay. That's a big, it's a long list as you can see there. The first is the cartography. <coughs> we, have, we have a cartography of the psyche limited to postnatal biography. Freud said, the newborn is a tabula rasa, it's a clean slate, there's really nothing there for a psychologist that precedes birth, including birth itself. Freud t toyed with the idea maybe for a while that anxiety might be uh, anchored in, in birth, the passage through the birth canal, maybe that is a source, that's a prototype of anxiety. But basically, this didn't make it into the academic circle. Rank created this book, this theory, you know, the trauma of birth. This is a footnote. It's not taken seriously in academic circles. Then um, Jung, who really opened it wide, you know, he's also a footnote, and uh, people like my Freudian analysts think that he was a mythomaniac, he was a psychotic or borderline who just tried to justify his psychosis. His whole, you know, his whole psychology is justified his psychosis. There's a fascinating chapter, I don't know how, how many of you know, but um, I had a chance to stop in New York City for, for a day. The, this now on display is the red, the red book, famous red book that Jung 
created when he was in spiritual emergency and the Jung's family didn't allow the publication. Now it's coming out. You can, you can order it on the internet. It's a $180 book and they are selling it for 105 if you come early, so you can pre-order it. <laughs> Just amazing, amazing. So, uh, okay, so when you work with these holotropic states, you cannot do it with Freudian analysis. People simply will not stay there. Now, whether you do it with uh, psychedelics, where you could say, well, something alien is coming with the chemistry, or you do it with breathing, which shows you that this is the psyche per se. I mean, there's nothing, you're know, not creating anything new, you're just bringing to the surface what is there. So uh, I added these two domains to the cartography. The, the um, biographical domain, recollective domain remains the same, but then this big cartography has the perinatal level where you have all four stages of birth recorded in your unconscious, and then the vast realm that we now call, uh, we now call transpersonal where basically the psyche resembles, you know, the maps that you find in the great Eastern uh, spiritual philosophies. I mean, the, it's anima, the psyche is anima mundi. It's, uh, it's not inside of our skull. It permeates existence. There is a master blueprint by superior intelligence, and our individual psyche is kind of teased out of that substrate. It, it partakes in the cosmic psyche and the boundaries are negotiable, so we can sort of go way beyond ourselves into different aspects of, of existence. Um, so I will, do, I will do more with the, with the slides uh, later. So the, the old psych the psychology, that old psychological map, is just the most superficial level of the new map. Then there is the perinatal, very powerful, and then the than the transpersonal. Uh, Joseph Campbell put, put it very succinctly with his Irish humor. He said, Freud was fishing while sitting on a whale. Or if you do the iceberg, when he said, what we thought the psyche was is just the top tip of the iceberg, and what psychoanalysis discovered is you know, the submerged part. You can now say what classical psychoanalysis discovered is barely the tip of the iceberg. and, and uh, that submerged part remained hidden for, for Freud and for his, for his followers, with the exception of the renegades. You know. Now, the architecture and emotional psychosomatic disorders. Traditional psychiatry would tell you that if something is not organic, if it's psychogenic, that it started postnatally. And we have the, the um, uh, Carl, Carl A. Abraham classification where you can link different problems to different stages of uh, fixation of the libido and, and object relationships. You, you know, um, there are oral things like addiction, alcoholism, uh, even manic depressive uh, uh, disorder, and then you have uh, obsessive compulsive is an anal fixation, and then you have um, anxiety and conversion hysteria is a phallic fixation and so on. If you work with, uh, with holotropic states, you always find some si significant connections to your biography, but it doesn't stay there. You find for the same problem, deeper layers on the perinatal level, and then further roots, which could be um, certainly karmic, which could be ancestral, which could be uh, phylogenetic, and then particularly archetypal. A lot of the, uh, what we call psychopathology, on a deepest level, it has a source, as an archetypal source. Now, this looks like really bad news. You know, we thought all we have to do is to go back and clear the stuff from childhood. Now, now the playground is really big. Now, the good, the, uh, the good news is that um, you also discover new, very powerful uh, healing therapeutic mechanisms. For example, reliving your birth and integrating the emotions and the, the physical feelings, the powerful, powerful mechanisms of uh, transformation and, uh, and healing. And then there are powerful mechanisms on the transpersonal level. You can 
uh, find that some powerful past life experience can be the source of uh, phobia or uh, the deepest root in asthma, and you get powerful healing in connection with past life experiences. An archetype surfacing, in, including a, a demonic archetype, that could be a very powerful, very powerful uh, healing mechanism. And then uh, the most powerful, of course, having a, an experience of cosmic unity. If it's properly, properly understood, properly supported, and you don't get into the hands of psychiatrists who would give you a diagnosis and stop it with, with tranquilizers. Those are amazingly healing experiences. You know, oneness with other people, oneness with nature, oneness with the, with the universe. Mr. Uh, Trump, we really have two minutes. Three. Okay, okay. Let me see which one. I, okay, I'll take, um, I'll take the the one that has to do uh, with strategy and self-exploration, uh, uh, strategy of therapy and self-exploration. We have many, many different schools of psychotherapy. Each of them will tell you something different about what are the motivating forces in the psyche, why symptoms develop, what they mean, and each of those schools gives you a, a different a technique that you use with your patient, how you interpret what's, what's coming up. The problem is that the phenomenal lack of agreement, each school would be different. So you, you have a problem, you flip a coin, and you choose a school, and you get a different story. What's wrong with you, and what is the scientific way of, of handling it? And uh, you see, if this were really how to work in, in psychology, what would, what would have to happen is that the results of these schools would be distributed on a Gaussian curve. Some, some school would have to ha have it right or close to right. They would have to get a lot of the results and the other people are sort of not, not making good interpretations. And so they would be distributed on those declining parts of this, of this curve. Uh, and people who, who did some study of the efficacy of psychotherapy found out that the differences really are not between the schools, but there are certainly differences inside of the school. Each school has like good therapists and not so good therapists. And what's, what's working there is very likely not the interpretations because they are different in different schools, but some elements that we don't even take into consideration, something like uh, the quality of the human encounter between the therapist and the, and the client, uh, the feeling of the client to be uh, uh, unconditionally accepted, probably for the first time in their lives because they didn't get it in the family, so feeling important, feeling loved, and so on. So the alternative that you have now in uh, coming from the, the work with these holotropic states is actually closest to what Jung was doing. You see, the, for Jung, the psyche is not inside of the skull. The psyche is cosmic, anima mundi, and there's no way the intellect can capture the psyche. The psyche is much bigger. The intellect is a partial function. You, don't, you cannot understand the psyche of the other person. Uh, and they come up with a, with a bag of tricks to fix it. So what, what can you do? For Jung, it was you, you create a container. You, he would use the term from alchemy. Uh, hermetic vessel where transfiguration happens. And then you give some method that the conscious ego can communicate with uh, self, with the higher aspect of the client, and the healing comes from within. The healer is inside. It's not a brilliant interpretation. And it happens uh, in a kind of a dialectic exchange using symbolic, symbolic language. For Jung, it was active imagination. The, the, uh, patient would come and with a dream and he said, lie down and let the dream continue. And it's, it's happening in statu nascendi, not reporting about. You can do shamanic drumming, you can do uh, work with breathing, you can work with, uh, with um, holotropic uh, breath work, or you can, you can work with psychedelics. And then you create that protective environment. And once that happens, the process has its own intelligence and we become like midwives, we become intelligent uh, supporters of this process. We are not the doers. 
in, in therapeutes in, uh, in uh, Greek is somebody who intelligently uh, participates in the healing process. It's not the fixer, it's not the doer. Uh, I'm sorry, this is all I can do in, the, in this time. It's a, it's a, a good story. Mi scuso della tirannia per quanto riguarda il tempo e ringrazio tutti quanti gli interventi. Rubando ancora un pochino di tempo al coffee break, io chiedo se c'è un, una domanda molto impellente o un'emergenza spirituale che proprio è lì, lì per uscire, insomma, di questo abbiamo tempo, non di più. Posso, posso parlare? Eh, è un'emergenza spirituale, la mia in questo momento, perché sono stato già eh, interrotto prima, avrei voluto partecipare già al dibattito precedente, è una condivisione, eh, mi chiamo Bertali, sono psichiatra e quindi c'era prima una collega che diceva cosa eh, può fare diciamo, la psichiatria eh, in questo momento istituzionale in una logica di eh, integrazione con il transpersonale. Per mia esperienza diretta, perché lavoro in un centro di salute mentale a Gorizia, molto poco, cioè sono 15 anni che io batto questo sentiero in perfetta, pura solitudine direi, e quindi il tentativo di eh, suggestionare, di contaminare altre persone, un approccio di questo tipo è estremamente difficile. E, è tanto tempo che propongo eh, anche una svolta culturale in questo senso, e, il professor Groff, e, e ringrazio lui, il professor Rosselli, per quanto hanno detto, ha scritto un libro importante che è Psicologia del futuro, io nel mio piccolo ho scritto da tempo un libro che è Psichiatria come medicina dell'anima, appunto per rilanciare il senso animico no? in quello che è un percorso di trasformazione psicoterapeutica. Eh, dire all'interno del servizio dove lavoro, guarda che il sintomo è un prezioso eh, alleato da ascoltare, una guida, eh beh, insomma è un delirio puro, ma io continuo a dirlo, mettere sotto critica il farmaco è una cosa, soprattutto nelle situazioni psicotiche, eh, veramente un qualcosa di estremamente difficile, io continuo a portare questa testimonianza. Parte in questo periodo proprio un'iniziativa che è SOS Cervello, campagna di psicofarmaco, sociale di psicofarmacovigilanza, invito questo illustre consesso a dare un contributo fattivo nella diffusione di questi messaggi. E per chiudere, per continuare all'interno dell'istituzione pubblica a portare avanti questo messaggio transpersonale, spirituale, non entro, ovviamente ci, ci intendiamo, penso, in questo contesto, richiede diciamo, la visione sottile, la presenza interiore forte del guerriero. Questa è una metafora, si parlava adesso di metafora, di simbolo, e da tanto tempo propongo questa metafora del guerriero di psiche. E allora, più guerrieri di psiche lavorano non solamente in società ma anche all'interno delle istituzioni, non parlo solo di eh, istituti sanitari ma anche di eh, scuola per esempio, e più riusciremo a entrare in questa logica di cambiamento e di trasformazione epocale. E guerriero di psiche poi è anche colui che eh, si esprime simbolicamente in certi rituali. Questo pomeriggio, mi piace dirlo, tengo un incontro che è il sacro rituale dei guerrieri di psiche che propongo anche a persone con problematiche psichiatriche importanti, sia individualmente sia di gruppo. Grazie per l'attenzione e spero per la collaborazione nella diffusione di questo messaggio. Ok, just, uh, just one word. Uh, I left here some flyers, just sample flyers on this desk. Uh, and there's more in the, you know, on the desk there, in the lobby, if you are interested. Some of the events that you can participate in. Um,